Okay, hello again students. This is Professor Bell and I'm going through some of the um, actual information through chapter one. Even though I don't have a solid you know, name maybe for all of these videos, uh, I will at least reference them within there and then on the title pages. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at what physical geography is and what it does. Um, it certainly means to um, kind of leave humans out of the mix, but because humans are such a major uh, player uh, one of those dominant species that's ever been on this planet and able to change uh, physical systems by our actions, uh, we have to consider humans at least. But if we just stand back and look, it kind of uh, goes along with the previous videos that you saw of the lithosphere, atmosphere, cryosphere, all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, let's look at how geographers that I went to school with, uh, what some of them became. Uh, meteorologists, of course, there's a, a rash of, of female meteorologists on a lot of the newscasts, and I can, I can say that uh, I, I went to school with one of the, um, the females that worked for a time in Nashville as, as a uh, forecaster. Um, it's for either uh, sex, though, but I've certainly seen women really be drawn to this, and we can see that females are heavily populating Nashville newscasts. Um, but climatologists take a longer view. Uh, when you look at meteorology, this is weather. Time after time, day after day, year after year, that builds for climate. And so I didn't go to school with any climatologists, but I did go uh, with uh, some other individuals, depending on what their um, interest or study was like geomorphology. So that's just the earth, geo, and how it changes through time. And so understanding that change and the pace of change is important. Um, I delved heavily in biology classes when I was in school, thought I might be a biogeographer, but never could really um, uh, decide on one particular thing to do because I liked it all so much. So I'm a generalist. Uh, that said, though, uh, I did work in soil and water like soil scientists and hydro hydrologists do when I was an environmental scientist for a couple of companies cleaning up um, uh, messes around uh, Tennessee and, in fact, in many other states from Texas to work in a Superfund site in West Virginia. So why I'm showing you this of oceanographers and glaciologists and others, there's a lot of fields here for people with good spatial understanding that you can focus on and... Uh, and, uh, you know, like the soil scientists, if you see the signs around as you're driving, there's soil conservation districts. Soil is a, a valuable resource that we all too often waste. So um, if any of these things through the semester interest you, know that there are um, pathways to careers in these. OK, um, as we look at this uh, through the environmental and people prism, we kind of see that there's well, there's human geography like geopolitics or as I took a lot of historical geography classes as well, really love cultural geography, uh, that would fall into anthropology. So you kind of see a spatial blending of the two uh, when you see what is purely about space uh, versus an, a field of study. So uh, for biogeography, obviously biologists are doing a lot of that, okay? Uh, climatology or astronomy. Now, I don't know too many mathematical geographers, to be honest with you, but um, these are all viable fields uh, for anyone who's interested. Okay, so as we look at science here, we, we need to look at a couple things too, just so you understand that we're building here. We're building on top of things, and we m may or may not throw some things on the ash bin of history, um, but as you look here uh, through these revolutions that we have, like in 1859, when uh, Darwin, um, you know, publishes about evolution and speciation, we'd see that um, other fields that were legitimately seemingly based in science uh, would just kind of go away because this is the answer. Uh, we have descent with modification. Um, you see Newtonian phys physics, though, evolving. Uh, again, not necessarily all of it thrown away, but redefined and, and recategorized after the theory of relativity um, uh, and uh, Einstein. So, again, I'm trying to give you a decent foundation in science, even though this isn't technically a science class. It's a human, you know, social science class, not a hard science um, natural science class, but I'm blending the two things to hopefully get the material across to you uh, better and easier and more understandable. 
available for you. So uh, we certainly use uh, on the bottom here the space uh, of locating things and we do that through latitude and longitude but we also told you we do it through relative location of comparing one place to another. Uh, characteristics are really important in geography of you know what what is it made of? What is its relationships? What is the um, you know what makes it distinct from other things? Uh, if you if you take a, a look at moths or or heck, uh, lots of insect species, and I'll, it's hard to say. Oh, this one is different from that one. If they're not interbreeding, clearly, clearly they are different species. But to a lay person looking at you know flies or or whatever, it's very difficult to discern those things. Nonetheless, characteristics of those things and where that took place. Were those maybe mutations and where the population shifted to become a, a wholly new species? Certainly takes time to do. So, uh, and seeing how the distribution works. This all went into the, into, um, Darwin's, uh, you know, look into evolution here. Of what is the distribution of those plants and animals and, and what is their feeding patterns and, and, and what role do they, again, do they play? So how do we, um, how do we, how do we as scientists collect data? you know, in the field to understand it better. Well, listen, uh, we used to only have maybe, what, the five senses to work with, the touch and see and smell and taste and so forth, right? But with our ability to see things better, like with microscopes or telescopes or meters of, of or thermometers or barometers, those kinds of things, we can measure stuff better. So experiencing and charting and measuring things became better as technology became better, uh, ways in which we could see it. So cartography now, um, it, I love old maps, but now they're all done by computers and they're incredibly detailed, okay? Um, so we certainly use uh, computers and the internet. We certainly use satellite and other remotely sensed images. So understanding that the technology goes hand in hand with how we understand our planet, like with this showing El Nino or this guy uh, in the field logging water resources or counting tadpoles. I don't know. But this is this is the technology that we have to better understand our planet. And that's why we, we know it better now than we ever have before. Okay, mentioned absolute and relative location. This one's in your book. Take a look at it. I'm going to move on, though. Uh, take a look at this image right here. This is a, is a mosaic stitched together uh, night lights of the planet. You can get this from NASA if you want to. So you can easily tell Florida and the Great Lakes, for instance. Um, but one thing I wanted to show you that changes over time, since time is an issue here. Uh, this is Minneapolis, St. Paul right here with Chicago being right here. Uh, but look out in this area and then let's look at the change that happened during the Bush administration when uh, fracking for, for um for uh, oil and oil shale happened. And so this is the Bakken shale activity out here. So here's Minneapolis that I showed you, St. Paul, the Twin Cities. And you'd say, well, why in the world is there night lights? What in the world's that got to do with anything? Well, these are fires. They're burning off the methane explosive gases. So this was um, America in, in, in a, a, a power crisis, a fossil fuel crisis. We still have loads of, of resources that we can tap into. The question is, should we do that? And if it's for drop in prices and everybody's happy, yes. But what are the outcomes? Well, climate change, clearly. Um, so balancing those things is having enough information to, to decide, is it useful? Should we, you know, how should we plan for the future? So understanding uh, that, you know, shale oil or up here in Alberta and the tar sands of Canada are going to have a big impact on CO2 releases and the, you know, uh, climate change keeps moving apace. Okay. Um, the changing earth is such that we know that glaciers are going away. Now, is this glacier finally gone in Glacier National Park? No. Um, will they all be gone eventually? And the answer is probably yes. We just don't know exactly when. Um, so putting a timetable on when the last one will melt is, is not a wise venture. But that said, we see what the trend is and that mountain glaciers are going away. Um, so moving forward with this, certainly, certainly through observations, uh, time does play a role here in how we see space and change occurring over time. Like, for instance, the upthrust of the Colorado Plateau, then to be inscribed by the Colorado River, to thus then reveal the Grand Canyon. And oh, somewhere on the uh, order of one to two billion years of hi history in rock. 
And so seeing those changes and understanding those changes through time uh, is is really important part of the spatial science that is geography. OK, so um, boundaries real quick, too. We may draw hard lines on maps, but very rarely do we see hard lines in the natural world. There's usually a blending of one thing to the next. Um, a buffer zone, if you will, or a transitional zone from, <clears throat> say, one climate to another or one species to another. So make sure you understand that the lines are only suggestions at times. <laughs> they can be hard, but they can be certainly uh, mutable as well. Okay, um, so going forward here, look at impacts on the earth of, of seasons and tides, earthquakes and floods, long-term changes and cycles of how things work. Um, so uh, showing you some of this now, y'all are probably old enough to experience the tsunami and the Sendai earthquake. Um, so that was in 2011, only 10, 10 years ago, but the one I really uh, remember was the one in 2004, which claimed a quarter of a million people's lives, and that was the one that hit in Indonesia and killed people in Africa and South Asia and certainly in Southeast Asia uh, with a tsunami. And so uh, this is, for instance, what happened when the epicenter was near Banda Aceh and when, this, when the um, tsunami came, there was, there was no place to hide, none at all. And so knowing that, these are natural threats, and you ask, well, why would people live close to those things if those threats existed? Well, why do people live close to volcanoes? Because, well, yeah, I'm sorry, um, you know, the soil around them is great. Uh, why, do, why do people live on the prairies if, if uh, tornadoes are all the time? You know, you ask these questions, but they obviously have answers, and it's a risk and reward aspect for it. So um, it is what it is. We have warning systems now for tsunamis and can certainly save more lives than we could in the past. But let's look, too, though, that humans are major players in um, how the Earth uh, you know, looks now. So this was the fourth largest lake in the world. It's called the Aral Sea. And now, as you've seen it, oops, sorry, now as you've seen in your textbook, um, it's nothing of the sort. So I'm going to show you um, a quick video uh, of this. So I'll be right back. Hold on. So I'm on um, a website that will show you here from 2000 to 2018 what happened with the Aral Sea. So hopefully this is going to play. And there we go. So they've got satellite images from 2003 to 2004 showing you the changes. Now, again, it's called the Aral Sea. It's a sea because it was salty and uh, salt water was always associated with the oceans. But as you look at this, this was the fourth largest lake in the world. And you'll see that through time, they've tried to release the rivers of the Amudarya and Siridaria, which were blocked during the time of the Soviet Union for irrigation projects. Uh, they've tried to let some of those waters go and reclaim this. But this is one of the biggest disasters in all of the 20th century. And we can see what um, happened with this as, as, again, those waters were diverted for cotton, for export, for food products and the like. And so... If we say that the system's too big for us to change, uh, that's about the biggest lie that you can see. This is a big planet, but we've made it wholly our own. Um, and with every inhalation and exhalation, guys, you are changing climate. So I'm going to stop this one now and come back and uh, I'll work on one other aspect in Chapter 1 before we move on. Okay, so I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.